Hey guys, welcome back to Reserved Investments on YouTube. So I'm gonna answer a couple of questions in here because this is gonna be part three of our 500 subscriber Q&A. Back on December 5th, 2019, I uploaded a 500 subscriber thank you video where I solicited questions that I would answer in upcoming videos. Well, this is part three of that particular series. Most likely there may be a part four. I have to go through and look through the comment sections and make sure that I answered everyone's question. If I did not answer your question in part one, part two, and it was not answered in this particular video, let me know in the comment section below and I will gladly do a part four to expand on a lot of these questions more in depth because I did get asked a lot of in-depth questions. I also have a lot of great new content and original content premiering for this channel. We're gonna get talking about Rolex watches, art, collectible first edition books, other more esoteric collecting markets, and of course, we're gonna go back and finish our discussions on WADA games, VGA, video game grading, and of course, more commentary on pop culture based collecting topics. So let me start off really quick, and I'm not taking these in any order, just so that you're aware, but I do want to talk about this because I think it's very important. There's a lot of people that are leaving me feedback where they wanted me to see more topics devoted to comic book collecting, and more specifically, an analytics of the vintage comic book market. For those of you that were with me since the beginning, you guys are aware I did do a video on CGC graded comic books, my thoughts on the market as a whole, with a focus more specifically on superhero based comic books and collectibles. I will visit that topic again soon. It's just going to take me several weeks to cycle back to talking about vintage comic books and the market as a whole. So, where we're going to go next is a lot of people are also asking me about collector's editions of games. So I just want to be very clear in this answer because I keep getting asked this question a multitude of different ways on every video that I do. Collector's editions, in my opinion, are not really a good investment because it goes back to the concept of organic collectability versus mass-produced scarcity. And I know some of them can be valuable, but I don't see them being valuable for the long term. You know, you got to remember, guys, most people that buy up this stuff are buying it on the secondary market, so they're already paying a premium for this stuff. So if it's already selling for a premium and the item just came out, or it came out within the last six months, you gotta understand that in most cases, that item was created with mass market scarcity in mind. Those particular items do not have organic collectability. I've used this example again, now that I have new subscribers, I'm gonna say it once more before we get into this. You have to understand that an original Alpha Edition Black Lotus game card, a Pokemon Illustrator game card, or a copy of Stadium Events, when these guy get items first came to market, they were not coveted by collectors. Most collectors and enthusiasts back, back in the day didn't even want those items. They were collecting something else. They pretty much used them, either threw them away, or flipped them on the secondary market with little profit incentive in mind. How many copies of an Alpha Black Lotus survived? How many copies of a Pokemon Illustrator card survived? How many copies of Stadium Events were kept factory sealed? Very few. Whenever we look at the market for mass-produced scarcity, most of those items are kept factory sealed in mint condition because people view them as high-end collectibles. Ironically, they are not high-end collectibles. They are something that was just produced like a flash in the pan item. It's a concept that the manufacturer knew would sell really well because they hire really educated people who understand economics, finance, and also the antiques and collectibles marketplace. And when you're one of those people that work for a Nintendo or Funko Pop or limited run games or Lego, you understand that the antiques and collectibles marketplace can be manipulated. So Nintendo puts out a product like this, the Dreamers edition of Link's Awakening, and people will go nuts to get it because you gotta pre-order it, chances are you won't get it and your collection won't be complete. That's how mass-produced scarcity works. It works on the Timmies and the Poindexters out there who have no understanding of sophisticated collecting markets and also how they're being manipulated by Wall Street and a lot of these companies. So I hope that clears that up. So first question, if possible, I would like to see 
or at least have you discuss some of your more valuable first edition collectible books. By far, the holy grail book that I have in my collection that is a first edition is The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. I love classic literature. I love books that deal with tragedy, love and loss, and also unrequited love. A lot of my favorite books are Ethan Frome by e Edith Wharton, Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, um, Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck, Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett. On the other side of the proverbial coin, or book I should say, I also like first edition horror books by Stephen King and or Clive Barker. So those are some of the books that I collect. The problem is when it comes to classic literature books, if you're looking for first editions, the prices have, accelerate, have accelerated exponentially over the last several years and or decades. So for instance, back in the 1990s when I bought my copy of The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, that was a first edition book, but I purchased it for less than $5,000 and it is in fine condition for those of you that understand book collecting terms. And I should state this, if you don't understand book grading terms, a fine condition book is equivalent of a near mint condition comic book. They just use a different grading scale. Fine is the, the top tier of the book collecting grading scale. So I'll han handle that in an upcoming video where I talk about collecting first edition books overall, but it's important to understand the market works a little bit differently than other antique and collectible markets. Now, that being said, if you were to go on the market today and look for a first edition copy of The Great Gatsby in fine condition, you would be paying tens of thousands of dollars for that particular book on average. So that market has exploded. So because of the prices being paid in that realm, my collecting of those books has greatly dis diminished. That's why I'm starting to go after a lot of first edition Stephen King books or Clive Barker books or more modern era books from a lot of the well-known literary masters of today, more so than classic literature. But my heart, my soul, and my love is classic literature with a focus on love and loss and unrequited love, to answer your question. Um, overall, they are a great long-term investment. I've said this before, Great Gatsby is an iconic book. Um, I think future generations will covet The Great Gatsby. I would even like to see The Great Gatsby be remade in present time. Let me use this as an example. Let's suppose that they could do him as somebody who is involved in the marijuana trade or even maybe the drug trade who falls in love with somebody like Daisy and it's kind of an esoteric story. I think that that would be excellent if they even did that. They don't even have to keep making it where it's set in the 1920s because even what we're going through today politically resembles what happened in the 1920s when you start talking about income inequality and, and the like. So ironically, what most people don't understand about The Great Gatsby is not only is it a story of unrequited love or really obsessive love that was idealized, it's also a story about income inequality. The, the tensions that were in the 1920s take center stage as one of the active plot backdrops of The Great Gatsby. So ironically, The Great Gatsby could happen today and it would still be considered iconic and a universal theme. Enough said on that. Let's go to the next question here. So happy you're doing a Q&A format in regards to high-end luxury watches and the fashion market in general. Has it followed the Hermes example, meaning in regards to Birkin bags? The answer is no. This is why. Anybody who wants a Rolex or a Petit Philippe watch can easily go to the primary market where they're sold and buy one. Most people don't seem to realize this. Rolex watches are mass produced. They're high quality, don't get me wrong, but they're not really handcrafted like people have this idea of a watchmaker sitting in a little, little cubicle making Rolex watches by hand. A lot of the production is done by modern machinery and technology. That being said, if you want to buy a Rolex watch, you can. Nobody's going to say that they're not going to sell it to you. With Hermes Birkin bags, they limit the market on purpose to create demand. That would never work with certain goods, especially when we start talking about pop culture collectible based items. Because could you imagine if you walked into your GameStop and you wanted to pre-order a copy of Link's Awakening, the Dreamers edition, and the clerk said to you, well, I don't like you today. I'm not gonna allow you to pre-order this game. You know how much chaos would ensue on message boards 
and also on Twitter and Facebook in regards to Nintendo. Or if you walked into your Lego store and you wanted to buy a Star Destroyer Ultimate Collector Series set for like, what, $700, $800? And they said, I'm sorry, we're limiting how many we can sell today. And we don't think you're of important person to where we want to sell this item to. It would cause chaos. The mass-produced collectibles market cannot be compared to the high-end luxury goods market. They're two different marketplaces entirely. Hermes has pretty much done so much market research and paid a lot of money to go into the psychology of the high-end luxury consumer that they honestly deserve to profit off this market. You know, I created the video on Hermes Birkin bags, not just to educate my viewers, but also because I'm in awe of what they were able to do and I give them a lot of credit. Now I am gonna be doing an upcoming video on luxury watches, mainly featuring Rolex and also Patek Philippe. And I apologize for how I'm pronouncing Patek Philippe, but I am not French. That's a French company. So ironically, I think that there's a lot of interesting tidbits that are occurring in those markets, but even Rolex is not in the same caliber as an Hermes Birkin bag. Um, Here's another example. I want to answer your question in full. Let's say Nintendo produces a game and intentionally limits it to 500 pieces and on a guest list, etc. Nintendo would get so much flashback and so much scorn from a lot of their hardcore fans, it wouldn't work. And here's why. Let me explain why. Hermes is a luxury goods manufacturer. Nintendo is traditionally an entertainment and consumer goods company. So the markets that they're operating in are not comparable. And if Nintendo ever tried to go in that direction, a lot of their hardcore fans, casual enthusiasts, and the like would condemn them for doing so. When Hermes created the Birkin bag, they were already a luxury goods manufacturer. At the time when the Birkin bag hit the market, there were other competing products, and there still are to this day, that compete for that luxury goods marketplace. The difference is, because it's luxury, people have this idea that it should be hard to get, it should be expensive, and it should be low supply, high demand. Nintendo is not able to market items in that caliber. Neither is Wizards of the Coast, neither is Lego, neither is the Pokemon Company, neither is any of your comic book companies, Funko Pop, and or Limited Run Games. If Limited Run Games, if you want a perfect example of this, look what happened with Revenge of the Bird King. Revenge of the Bird King slipped out. How much bad PR and publicity did Limited Run Games get out of that item? I can go on any forum, message board, and they're still getting torn up over that particular incident to this day. If they were a luxury goods manufacturer, that would not have happened. But they are more in the mass-produced collectible marketplace, much like Funko Pop, where if you do something like that, it's going to bite back at you from your hardcore fans. So it would not work. Those markets are not the same. Next question. I'd love to hear an in-depth analysis of the vintage comic book market. It is coming. I promise you. I will be doing more videos on the vintage and modern era comic book collecting marketplace coming up on this particular channel. It's going to take me a couple of months to circle back to it. I will try to put those videos into production. So at least within three or four weeks, maybe the first one will appear on this channel. And you guys can pretty much get your fix because a lot of people have been asking me to do more videos on Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, and also the vintage comic book marketplace. They are coming, guys. I promise you. One quick question here. Can you give your insights about the collectible card market as a whole? Yes, right now, Magic the Gathering and Pokemon are pretty much king. If you're on the sports card side of things, you want to go after vintage, grade it, pre-1970 sports cards if you're talking baseball. Now, when you start to get into more esoteric sports like hockey and or basketball, there are some exceptions to that rule because unlike baseball cards that were mass produced in the 1980s and 90s, certain other sports production was cut. So some of those cards are considered valuable to this day. You just have to study the market and know what you're doing. If you're gonna invest long-term and you have a passion for vintage sports cards, it is a good market if you're buying right. As for Magic the Gathering and Pokemon, I've said this before, you want vintage authentic factory sealed booster boxes in near mint condition or better. Do not go after vintage cards, whether they're graded or not. 
the market for those particular items is too unpredictable and it's speculative right now, especially with the reserve list prices of Magic the Gathering cards collapsing as we speak. Now, I think eventually that market will stabilize, but it's gonna take years. And for those of you that thought that that was a great investment, I have people calling me and literally telling me, Sean, I spent $100,000 on vintage reserve list Magic cards back in 2016 or 2017. Today, my collection's only worth $50,000. What do I do? And my question to them is, well, why did you spend $100,000 in a speculative market if you were worried that there was most likely a chance where the market was going to fall and you were going to lose a significant amount of money playing in that market? And their answer always is, well, I was looking at what I could make. If the market kept going higher, I would be able to turn that $100,000 into $150,000 or $200,000. And this is my next question to them, and this is how I'm going to end this video. So let's suppose that you spend $100,000 in Magic the Gathering cards and the market shoots up to $150,000. Are you seriously going to look me in the eyes and tell me you would have sold at that point? You would have kept them thinking it's going to go higher and higher. And that's why, guys, I don't recommend that people who don't know how to analyze markets in the antiques and collectibles trade get involved in a lot of these more speculative markets. There's a lot of Timmies, a lot of Poindexters out there that look at me and they go, Sean, you're wrong. I bought a video game for $100 and it's worth $1,000 today. Ha ha. And I look at them back and I say, why the hell didn't you sell it? And they look at me and they go, well, it might go to $2,000 or $3,000 or $5,000. And I look at them back and I say, I'm sorry, you're an amateur if that's your mindset. You have to understand that with speculative markets, if you put money into that market, you study the market and it goes up, you sell and cash out and you go into some other market. You don't keep following money after money in speculative markets because what you're doing, pardon my pun, you're building a house of cards and that house of cards can come crashing down at any time. Be very careful what you invest in guys for the long term. Understand a lot of these markets you guys are going after need to have pretty much market insight daily to keep up on the changes. With coins, currency, art, antique furniture, antique glass, sophisticated markets like that, you can pretty much buy your items, let them sit in a safety deposit box for 40 years without even looking what the market's doing. Now, if you're a smart investor, you still will monitor the market. But items like that have long-term collectability versus short-term speculative collectability. More on that in upcoming videos. Please leave your comments and your thoughts for this video in the comment section. And again, if I missed any questions, there will be a part four to this series, guys. Thank you for watching. Have a great night and thank you for subscribing.